When I was first learning to preach, one of the things they told us to do was always write your sermon and then go and get your introduction. And that's not how young preachers do it. But I spent the last week or so thinking about the sermon of forgiveness and deciding how to start this off. Now, I love the old story of the woman who was called into jury duty and they asked her, they said, uh, do you know the reason why you shouldn't serve? She said, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, I don't believe I should serve, this woman said, because she said, I don't believe in capital punishment. <coughs> I just don't believe in it. And the judge says, well, I assure you, this has nothing to do with capital punishment. It's, it, it's a case of a man who left his wife and cleaned out all their savings and ran away with his girlfriend. And she says, well, in that case, I can serve because I could be wrong about capital punishment. <laughs> I guess it depends on whose ox is getting gold that is the subject of forgiveness. You can forgive some things, but not others. But what got me was yesterday afternoon. Jeremy said, Dad, let's go out to the golf course. And so we went out to the golf course. And while we were there, uh, Bobby came up and started telling us the story of the ending of the NASCAR nationwide race yesterday. For those of you who I'm not going to use any names here of the, of the guilty parties involved, but if you care, you can go look it up if you're into that kind of thing. But the fellow who won the nationwide race yesterday was the first race he had ever won. And his father has followed him for years. Always goes there and brings his RV and sets it up and sets up on top of the RV and watches his son race. And yesterday, his son won his first race. The problem is, he and his son haven't spoken in four years. That's just hard for us to imagine. That unforgiveness. Now look, <coughs> Jeremy and I talked about this a little bit. You know, it has to do with who his girlfriend was. Well, I said, son, I don't care if you married a Zulu warrior princess. I would still talk to you. I cannot let my being upset with him prevent me from him being my son or from any of you being my brothers. And I thought, boy, that really does go to it. Because unforgiveness can be that devastating that you would not speak to your son. That you follow every Sunday, every Saturday, you go to his races, but you don't talk. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. The Many other translations say seven times 70. A lot of times. Growing up, I remember hearing someone talk about, and I've heard this more than once, this woman and her husband, he had an affair and she forgave him and took him back. Everybody went, I don't know if I can do that. He had another affair, she took him back again, and everybody went, are you crazy? What if he had an affair three times and you took him back? Could you go along with that? Well, that's ridiculous. You don't have to forgive no what did Jesus say? He said that same person, let's, let's go with the most <coughs> conservative number here. That same person forgave them 77 times. I don't have anybody I've ever forgiven 77 times. None. I don't have anybody I've forgiven 77 times. But Jesus said, if that's what it if, if that's what happens, be willing now, now look, I don't want to just act like and I don't want you to go away from your thing. Well, he just said, I got to forgive everybody. There's, there's more to it than that. But I want you to have that number in mind. Uh, because sin will enslave us. <clears throat> in the book, Will Daylight Come? There's a story told about how sin enslaves and how forgiveness frees. A little boy, I love this. <clears throat> I love the story. A little boy was visiting his grandmother. And uh, he got his first slingshot. He practiced in the woods, but he never could hit his target. As he came to his grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. You know what's going to happen, don't you? On an impulse, he took aim and let fly. The stone hit, and the duck fell dead. The boy panicked. Desperately, he hit the, duck pile, the dead duck in the wood pile, only to look up and see his 
big sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in washing the dishes today. Did you, Johnny? And she whispered to him, remember the duck. And so Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing, and Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me make supper. Sally smiled and said, that's all taken care of. Johnny wants to help fix supper. Again, she whispered, remember the duck. And Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, Johnny had, had all he could take. And he went to Grandma and confessed to killing the duck and listen to her words from the book. I know Johnny, she said, giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing because I love you. I forgave you. I wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave out of you. Unforgiveness makes slaves out of us. I want you to consider two or three things here. Number one, and I actually had slides for this, but I didn't want to be tied to them. And I didn't want to preach from the, up there, so I wanted to preach down here, so I decided not to do it. And I think the subject is so important that you'll be okay and that you'll listen to this. But here's the first point. I want you to consider the meaning of forgiveness. <coughs> Back about two years ago, Jeremy said, Dad, I have a chance for us to go over on this hill up here that I've always admired and wanted us to build a hilltop. Right on top of that hill, but I've understood that that land was probably too expensive for us, and so I never pushed it. He says, we're going to go up there and, and shoot a, in a, a skeet shooting contest. And I said, son, number one, you've never shot skeet. And number two, I've never shot skeet. And number three, we don't, have, we don't have shotguns. Well, he said, Dad, they'll love the shotguns. I said, I'm going to be terrible at it, son. I will be terrible. He said, uh, Dad, I think I'll be pretty good. I said, son, you've never shot a shotgun. Why do you think he'd be pretty good? He hounded me as only he can do. And we went up there to that hill that afternoon and they loaned a shot. I had enough sense to say, we want to borrow 20 gauges. I didn't want to borrow 12 gauges because I knew that. And when I shot the 20 gauge first, I thought, this really doesn't hurt at all. But after 80 shots, I was trying to slide the gun down my arm. Because it, but I did that just once and it hurt real bad. So I put it back up into my sore spot. But we each got 80 shots. And Jerry hit 34. I was amazed. We got eight shots. He hit 34. And together, we got 38. <laughs> I didn't remember y'all all being such great math. I didn't remember that. But sometimes you just have to forgive when people make you go and do silly things. That's easy, isn't it? But what about the really hard thing? The really hard things. What does it mean to forgive? Number one, I want to begin with what forgiveness does not mean. And this, this is important because some of the reasons people don't forgive other people is because they, they misunderstand what it means. So I'm going to tell you what it doesn't mean that people think it means. Number one, forgiveness does not mean forgetting. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. I knew this woman and this man married that he did something terrible and she forgave him and they stayed together and about a year later he did something else bad and she threw that up to him he said I can't believe that if you had forgiven me you would have forgotten it that is the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard but I've known men to make that statement especially men I mean some women have too but especially men if you would forgive me you would have forgotten it that's not what it means <coughs> forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting that is just a statement trying to manipulate somebody. I'll tell you more about what that means in a minute so you'll understand that statement a little more. Number two, forgiveness does not mean it's okay. I think that's the number one reason that people struggle with forgiving somebody because if I forgive them, they'll think it's okay. No, it doesn't mean you're okay. You and the one you forgive are okay. But what went on was not okay, is not okay and never will be. <clears throat> Number three, forgiveness does not mean it did not hurt. I can't act like it didn't hurt. Uh, that, that's ridiculous. Of course it hurt. And the one being forgiven must never act like it didn't hurt. And number four, 
Forgiveness does not mean they can do it again. Forgiving an offense does, does not give one the right to do something over again. So, to do it again. So let me tell you what forgiveness really does mean. Perhaps this is best seen in Mark 16, verse 6 and 7. Love this text. This text, I don't even think it was intended to be a statement about forgiveness, but when I read it again and look deeper into it, I go, wow, there it is. There it is. Listen. Mark 16, 6 and 7. Don't be alarmed. The disciples come to the grave of Jesus after he's been killed and resurrected and he's gone. Don't be alarmed, they said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. Good news. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. But Peter's one of the disciples. But go and tell his disciples and Peter going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And here's what I love about that. Peter had messed up so much that you can't even imagine. He had denied that he knew Jesus Christ. Denied him. And then there was that moment. Jesus said, Jesus told him, he said, no, listen. He, he was so big about this. Jesus told his disciples that Thursday night, he said, oh, what are you going to forsake me? Peter said, listen, though everybody forsake you, I will never forsake you. Well, he was full of himself, wasn't he? And y'all don't tell him I said that when we get to the judgment day. <laughs> but he was full of himself. I will never do it. Peter knows that he was like that. He knows that. And Jesus said to him, Peter, 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 before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. And guess what he did? He denied him three times. Three times. How do you get past something like that? Now, let me tell you what, what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is reaching out. Jesus through these angels are reaching out to people. They didn't just say, go tell the disciples. Elsewise, they get there, they might be able, they might say, look, uh, the angels told us uh, to tell you disciples that he's risen. Peter was saying, well, he didn't mean me. I mean, when it came to, when, every, when the chips were on the line, when it was dangerous, when things were tough, that's not him. He didn't mean me. He didn't mean me. But just so that Peter wouldn't feel that, the angel said to him, you go and you tell the disciples, and especially Peter, that he is resurrected. That was Jesus' way, God's way of reaching out to Peter, saying, Peter, I know you did it. I'll tell you, one of the, one of the most fascinating moments in the, in, in the life of Christ and Peter and all that must have been after that rooster crowed that third time, and they were, they were leading Jesus Christ out of the place where they had been trying to find some wrong with him. It must have been 5, 5.30 in the morning. And Jesus walks out and he looks over at Peter. And Peter looks at Jesus. And the Bible says, Peter left. He, he knew. And now, now what does it mean? There's a beautiful song uh, called He's Alive. And in that song, they sing about this story. You know, he's alive and I'm forgiven. It says that... Uh, they're waiting one day, and the, just before the word comes, he's alive, he's alive, we've seen it. Peter's thinking to himself, I think he must have thought this, I really do. Even if he is alive, what does it mean to me? Because when it came the time to own him or deny him, I denied him. Forgiveness means that you reach, you see, if I've got a problem with Janet, I don't just say she ever comes to me. Let me tell you what I was told when I was growing up. Maybe, you, maybe you've heard this piece of false theology. You don't have to give people unless they ask you. Really? Let me tell you what, that doesn't come from the Bible. Jesus forgave Peter, and Peter certainly hadn't come to Jesus and said, we forgive you. You forgive me. But I've got four reasons why I want to forgive, why I forgive people. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get there. I want to read to you an article that I wrote four or five years ago about forgiveness. It's called, I called it Forgiven, Forgive and Forget. It was more than 10 years ago, but I can still remember her like it was yesterday. Now I will tell you it was more than 20 years ago. But I can still remember her like it was yesterday. She came to me with tears in her eyes. She and her husband had an argument and she mentioned an old hurt to him. He snapped back, you told me you had forgiven me, but you lied. You had really forgiven me, you would have forgotten that. 
feeling guilty, she wanted to know how one could forget old hurts. How do you do that? There are two answers to that. Number one, it takes time. And number two, you don't truly forget. It's just that one day it becomes relevant to you. Let me, let me talk about it. it takes time. There are no Bible passages that can erase memory. There are not. Old wounds heal, but healing is a slow process. Old wounds do not really disappear. They just fade and become less relevant. Number two, you don't really forget. Even God does not truly forget. I know, I know. He said in uh, Jeremiah 31, 34 and other places, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God did not lose his omniscience. It's not like on the judgment day if you tell God some terrible thing he did to say, really? Man, I didn't know that. That wouldn't even be sincere. God does not lose his omniscience. Here it is, folks. He made a decision not to call an old sin to memory. When we forgive and forget, that is what we really do. We just forgive and then just choose not to call that old offense to our memory. As several of us were helping the family, this woman moved into a new house. I took a picture off the wall and there was a big hole behind it. At first the lady looked startled and then she confessed. That is where my ex-husband knocked me into the wall. I just put a picture over it. That's the way to forgive and forget. The old wound is there, but we just put a, a new picture over it. And the new picture helps both parties. Maybe I could have called the article instead of forgive and forget, forgive and cover. Because that's what we do. We just forgive and cover. When I was here several years ago, uh, I was thinking about this working over here. It was 22 years ago when I first met you folks. When I was here 22 years ago, I, I, I was taking a counseling class. In the counseling class, we had to do group counseling. I was not very into counseling at first. As a matter of fact, when they told us we had to go get an hour of counseling, I didn't want to do it so much so that I said, well, can I have time to counsel my preacher? He said, yes. Or she said, yes. And so I drove up to Decatur and had my friend J.D. counsel me because I knew I could control that situation. <laughs> But we were sitting in group counseling and everybody has to share one of their problems. <coughs> How would you like if we all got in a group here today and we said everybody's going to tell somebody deep in their life that really hurts them? I don't want to do that. And you don't want to do it either. And I know it. But it was my turn and I had to tell something. And so I told about a rather serious offense from my, from my life, my own mother against me didn't go into all the details, but I told him not to get a good grade in class, <laughs> and that's kind of what you do. But then everybody starts telling them, because in groups, see, you've got a bunch of wannabe counselors who think they're counselors who are really running the show. They all started talking, and, well, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that, and I said, yeah, 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 right, right, right. Go tell her, you need to go confront her. I'm so irritated, everybody getting on, on the airwaves and confronting their mom and their dad. Are you joking me? Your mom and your dad did the best they could, and yes, they messed up, and so did mine, and guess what? So did I. Well, maybe not me. <laughs> so did I, and so will all of mine. It's just because we're human. Finally, though, one fellow was there, and this is a, a very secular class. Finally, one fellow was there who had served as a preacher for a while, who said something that shook him, and I kept saying, no, I'm not going to say something. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I like that. And it shook me to have to think about that. Do I owe it? But in the end, I knew that I was better off just forgiving and covering. Just forgive it and cover it up. Sometimes you can make things right, but when you can't make things right, just put a picture over the it. Cover it up, leave it with God. Now don't go away from here thinking Lonnie is saying we should never try to make things right with people. That's not true. I didn't say that. But when somebody is literally on their deathbed, you don't go scream in their face. Sometimes you just have to put a picture of things and love them anyway. Love them anyway. So 
So let me tell you, understanding all, understanding what forgiveness is and what forgiveness does, and you know, it's forgive and cover and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you why I forgive people. When I left here 12 years ago, I made one phone call to one person that I thought would try to hurt me more than anybody in all of my ministry had. He was shocked. Why did you can't believe you called me? Because someday we've got to go to heaven. I hope we both are there. And we've got to sit down together and love each other. But if we can't do it now, well, I just can't believe you I appreciate it so much. I, I can forgive people. I really can. Let me tell you the four reasons why. Number one, because I need forgiveness. So do you. But let me explain to you why it's so important for me to forgive if I need forgiveness. Because listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 32 to 35. The master called his servant in. You wicked servant, he said. And this is Jesus talking. You've got your Bible, listen to red letters. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? What is he telling us? He's saying he wants us to forgive people like we want to be forgiven. One of the famous generals in England's history, General James Oldenclark, after suffering some hurt, went to John Wesley, the, the old uh, Reformation preacher, and asked him about it. When told he needed to forgive, he told John Wesley, I never forgive. And I never forget. John Wesley responded, Then, sir, I hope you never see it. I told one old man who, who suffered a hurt worse than you have, and I don't even know all your problems. I told him, You have to forgive, you have to forgive. It's your brother. He said, I just can't do it. And I said to him, Then you will die a bitter old man. It's the fact. I, I, I have to forgive people because I need forgiveness. And the measure with which I forgive other people, God forgives me. Look at this, verse 35 again. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother in your heart, is what he said. Number two, I practice forgiveness because I need to put my burden down. I need to put my burden down. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed him, and poured perfume on them. Jesus tells us the reason for her burden when he said to her, Your sins are many. I, I forgive because I... I don't want to keep carrying that burden down. I don't have as much time as I'd like to. It's more like to have about an hour and a half, but I don't. So, because what I really want to do was get a couple of the kids to come up here. I would like to get a, a big old boy, maybe maybe about like the coat there, tall guy, and then a little girl, about this tall. And you say to them, fast you can race down to the bank and back, which one he's going to win? Well, the, little, the big, big boy is. Even the little girl will take that. Then you take a songbook and give it to him and say, now you have to carry that to you to win. Yeah, he is. And yet, if you give him another songbook, he still won't win. And another one, and he still is. But at some point, the burden he carries will be so great that that little child will beat him down there and back. And that's what happens to everybody who just keeps carrying the burden of their sins, of their unforgiveness, or maybe of somebody else's sin. I don't have the energy to keep carrying it. Uh, when Ginger graduated from chiropractic college years ago, she was so upset one day. She came in, she, she, she didn't have two nickels to rub together. And she, but what she did have was some books that she had bought, hundreds of dollars worth of books she had bought while she was a partner. And what she did at the end, she gave them to a friend who was going to sell them for her because Ginger was going to be up there. And after a few months, the girl told Ginger, she said, I borrowed half of them and didn't sell them. And the other half, I left in the car and they got wet and ruined. And there she was with no money and the asset she had, which was damaged, through somebody else's negligence. And I said, well, Ginger, what are you going to do about it? She said, Daddy, I'm not going to do anything. I don't have the energy to deal with that. 
carrying around <coughs> unforgiveness is a burden. Jeremy and I went through this one time last year. I can't think of a time in our life when I didn't, we didn't have a great relationship except for two weeks. And we've never talked about it, but I promise you, who knows about it? The girls one time, Janet and Ginger, started being so sweet to me. So sweet to me. I mean, it was just weird sweet. Why are you so good to me? When it came out, Jeremy had pierced his ears. And he knew that, well, my friend J.B. told his son, they said, they want your spirit. He said, no, he's fine. I'll get you a purse to go along with it. And that was kind of, I mean, I was up in that generation. I felt that way. But for two weeks, he and I didn't have much to say. Finally, he said to me, he said, Daddy, you act like I'm dead, like I'm not here. That really got me inside. It was a burden I was carrying. And if, if I'm angry with you, Tommy, I'm carrying that burden, not him. <laughs> Have you ever had this experience? Somebody come to you and apologize to you. Say, I'm sorry I was upset with you. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. But I didn't even know they were upset with me. <laughs> when, when Ginger was at free, this guy stopped her one time and said, Ginger, for six months now I've been giving you the silent treatment. And you thought, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but for six months, he was thinking about it. And she wasn't even thinking about it. I forgive people because honestly, it's a burden. You just got to put there. And you know, I know when you will. There's a famous saying in my family that you do something when it hurts enough. I love the story of the guy uh, who salesman comes up to the old farmer and is talking to him on his porch. And up on the end of the porch, there's a dog. Whoa! And they talk about the dog. Whoa! But you know, that's the best dog impression I can do. Because I'm not a dog person. They're talking more fun of the dog. Whoa! And he said, Mr. What's wrong with your dog? He said, Oh, he said, he's laying on the nail. And he says, Well, why didn't he move? He says, Well, I guess it don't hurt that much. <laughs> we will we will forgive people when it hurts enough if we're wise enough. But if, if it doesn't hurt enough, I guess we'll just keep on wallowing it. I forgive because folks, uh, being unforgiving is a burden I can't afford to carry around. I'm gonna go through these other two real quick because I know that. Beef tips are calling my name. <laughs> Number three, I need my energy for something else. I, oh, I, I, I have to do this because this, this means so much to me. Remember the story of Joseph? Joseph, uh, who went over to Egypt, and his brothers had thrown him into a pit, lied to the dad, and said he was dead. He wound up as a slave, and finally he wound up in prison, and through God's workings and intervention and amazing ways, he wound up as the number two guy in all of Egypt, and number one was very hands off. So he was it in the most powerful nation on earth. And a great crowd hit the land, and pretty soon his brothers came up and needed help. Can we get some food? And they go up to talk to this most powerful man in the land, and it was Joseph. They didn't recognize him because it had been it had been 14 years, and now this teenager is a young man. And he's not speaking to them in the Hebrew language. He's speaking to them in the Egyptian language. And he's not this peon of our brother. He's, they didn't even know who it was. But he finally revealed himself to them. And in the end, he takes them in. And he takes care of his brothers. He loves them. He watches over them. But daddy dies. His daddy's been with him now in Egypt too. And here's what they're thinking. You know what? He's been taking care of us because of daddy. So the Bible tells us, let me read this to you. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did? I, I, listen, I'd be with his brothers and I wouldn't you? Maybe he's, just taken, maybe he's been light because daddy's been here and daddy, they, he loved daddy so much. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. And I think they lied again. I don't think daddy ever said this. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. You know why? Because he had already forgiven them. And he wasn't carrying that burden anymore, but they were. For years now, they've been fed by the most powerful man in Egypt. They've been taken care of and given the choice land. And yet, all the time, there was this cloud 
hanging over there. And all they had to do was let it go. So when his brothers then came and threw themselves down before them, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Now, now, now let me just pause in there and say, I don't know why things happen like they do. But maybe God intends it for some kind of good. Here's a great quote for you. I, I'm a big lover of great quotes, but here's a great quote for you. In those tough times in life when you feel like God is not with you and trials are so hard, remember this, the teacher is always quiet in the test. And this was a test. But God intended it for good to accomplish what has now been done. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you the assured that it's for. See, he did he was so sad that they had carried this needless burden. Unforgiveness is a burden to carry around. Look again at the story. There were only four options that Joseph could have done when he saw his brothers. Number one, he could have refused to forgive them. He could have imprisoned them by doing so, but he, he could have given them cheap forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Sometimes wives give their husbands cheap forgiveness. I just gonna let it slide. I can't do anything with that man anyway. They could he could have just accepted it. You don't accept people's sin. And we could have had genuine forgiveness. Number four, and I'll quit after this one. One more scripture after this one. This one. I want to set, number four, the number four reason why I practice forgiveness is because I want to set a good example for my children. I want to set a good example for my children. A lady came to see me one day. She was dying of cancer. She said, do I have to fight it? I said, do you have daughters? She said, yes, I do. So let me answer this question for you this way. Someday, if your daughters are fighting the same cancer, do you want to just throw in the towel or do you want to fight? She said, I want to fight. I said, then you've got to be that way for them. Because they will do what they see. <coughs> You're the light of the world, Jesus said. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And nowhere is that more true than with me and my children. Well, they will do what I, what they see in me. Sometimes what I do is so loud that what I say cannot be heard. You remember the old point? I'm not going to quote it for you. Are you going to read about it? Remember it starts off with these words, if a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with fear, he learns to be apprehensive. It's a big long list of them, but all of them say simply this, our kids learn from us what they see in us. One thing I want my kids to learn from me is the, the ability to forgive. The ability to forgive. I will close with these words from Jesus Christ on forgiveness. And I, I cannot speak about forgiveness without reading these words, because listen to me. This then is how you should pray. And people then call it the model prayer, or the Lord's prayer. But listen to what he says about forgiveness. Because of all the things he tells them, it is only forgiveness. When Jesus finishes giving them this example of prayer that he goes back in and says, let me give you a little more commentary. This then is how you should pray in Matthew 6, 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. End of the model prayer. But now Jesus says, let me give you a little commentary. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't know if you know who Corrie Ten Boone is. Corrie Ten Boone uh, wrote several amazing books, but she once had told a story of not being able to forgive a person who had done her wrong. She had forgiven him, but she kept hurting about it. So that forgiveness, she didn't know, and she struggled with it. Finally, Corrie said she cried out to God for putting the problem to rest. And, and here's her words on it. I'm reading it. His help came to me in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor. Corey wrote, 
to whom I confess my failure after two sleepless weeks. Up in the church tower, the old pastor told me, is a bell which is rung by the pulling of a rope. But you know what? After the one who rings the bell lets go of the rope, the bell keeps on swinging. First ding, and then dong, slower and slower, ding, dong, ding, dong. Finally, one last dong, and it stops. I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive, we take our hand off the rope. But if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if, if an <coughs> angry thought may slip up when someone says something. They're just the ding-dongs of that old bell tower. Slowing down. And so it proves to be, she wrote. There were a, a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in the conversation. But the force, which was my willingness in the matter, had gone from them. They came less and less often, and at last stopped altogether. Yesterday, I was telling Liz the story of talking to her, and she interrupted to make another point for me and said, yeah, she said, what we have to have is time and distance. And I've used that principle a lot of times. Time and distance, time and distance. I said, yes, Liz, time and distance works, but only if we first have a will to forgive. Forgiveness. I want the forgiveness that God has offered to me. I want that in my life, and I know you want it in yours. We're going to offer an invitation song now. It may be that in this assembly there are some who know what it means to be a Christian but have never obeyed the gospel, never become a New Testament Christian. Repent, confess that you believe Jesus Christ, and be immersed in the baptizing water for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 38. If you're a child of God who's not been faithful and you want to come back to the Lord, whatever you need, won't you come while together and stand and sit?